Welcome to the Pre-Health Pod. My name is Lexi. And my name is Natalie. And we're a podcast by students for students who are here to meet you wherever you are. Welcome back. Hey, Natalie. It's 2024. Hi. Yeah. Happy New Year, Lexi. <laughs> what are your Happy resolutions? New Year. You got some oh, resolutions God. set up for 2024 yet? Well, I was going to meet with a dietitian, but they don't take my insurance. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just wow. kidding. That's an interesting uh, one. <laughs> that's not it. Uh, start medical school. Yay. Okay. Yeah. That, I don't know if that's a great resolution because that's figure not, out where I'm going. Not. Okay. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> Do yoga more. That's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah. That's another one I I said. This is so giving me bad luck. Did you know if you say what your resolutions are, they won't come true? What? I don't believe that. So. No. <laughs> Since when did New Year's resolutions become like birthday wishes? I don't think I don't, think I that's don't know. How that works. I yeah, don't know. No. Um, I'm sure it'll come true. Invest. That okay. was also. Oh, that's a unique one. <laughs> I know. Before yeah. I start med school and in you know have four hundred thousand dollars in loans. <laughs> wow, you're yeah. That's no. You're very smart. Your resolutions are so like formal. Mine are just like you know like drink water. <laughs> yeah, like, spend that's time a good with one. my friends. <laughs> Oh, and you're like invest and start medical. Wow, you're just awesome always. <laughs> I mean, you're awesome always. Drink oh, water. So that should have been mine. I don't drink water. Oh, well, you I literally start. was telling Alex, I have this horrible habit of filling my Stanley a quarter of the way because I don't have the patience to fill it up all the way. What? Because it's so much. That's the and most I'm hilarious thing I've ever heard. Thirsty because it runs out. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. just gotta give it like 30 seconds. It doesn't take that long, Lexi. It's so stupid. My water thing in my fridge is so slow. It takes yeah. like five minutes. Yeah, okay. That is kind of annoying then. I am very yeah. sorry. Maybe your resolution should be to get a new get a new fridge. <laughs> yeah, right. Move. Well, what, what, what did you do for New Year's? How did you guys celebrate? Yeah, I went to my friend's house. Uh, she also got into med school and she really wants to be my roommate. She also wants to come on the podcast. So we should do that at some point. Oh my gosh, I would love um, to meet her. Have she's her so awesome. She got into med school here the in same- Arizona. Okay. Yeah, the same one as me. Okay. And we're going to be roommates if I decide to go there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll see. I'm yeah. really excited. And I went to her That's house. So we went to this Thai restaurant and then we played Just Dance. And oh, I love Just Dance. I am obsessed. That was literally, I did the, I did 20 songs yesterday as my workout. Just that- straight. That's an incredible workout. That sounds like so much fun. Invite me. It was so fun. Alex was sitting on the couch watching me while I just like <laughs> stood yeah. in front of the TV and just danced. Oh my gosh. What's and your like your go-to Just Dance song? Mine was always Girlfriend by Avril Lavigne or yeah. It's Raining Men because I was like the Mine, Just Dance. Those are good. It's Raining Men. Yeah. Yeah. I still remember <laughs> some of the routine even though I haven't played in like 10 years. Oh my God. What's your favorite? You should play. Come over. And Let's we'll dance. It. Oh my God, okay. it's a great way to get active in the new year. So yeah, I'm living that's for that. also my new year's resolution. I paid for the Just Dance Unlimited. <laughs> Your resolution is to play Just Dance every year, maybe. <laughs> I paid for the Just Dance Unlimited because it was only $5, but I had to make three separate accounts. But it was so much fun because I bought the Just Dance 2021 and no good songs came out that year. I don't know why I bought it that year. For some reason, I thought I'd have all the songs, but it's only the songs from 2021. (laughs) And my favorite one is Starships. Oh, that's good, though. Because you, like, move your arms in a circle, and I really like it. (laughs) That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I love that. That's a great way to just work out and also have fun. And just, I love, like, the throwback song one. So those are more of my favorites. But I'm sure the 2021 one has some hidden gems. Like the Black Eyed Peas. (laughs) Yeah. Those are good. Gangnam Style is also really fun. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> what about you? What'd you do? Oh, my New Year's was actually kind of, it was crazy because I took a very spontaneous trip to Mexico. I was in Sonora. You Mexico. what? <laughs> yes. My friend actually on Christmas Eve, she texts me and she's like, I know this is super last minute, but my family is going to like my mom's hometown in Sonora, Mexico. And if you're available, like we would love if you could come. And they were leaving on the 26th, like the day after Christmas. And this is on Christmas Eve. 
And they were going for like a long time way like into the new year. And I was like, oh, should I go? That sounds like so interesting, like a good way to spend the new year. So then, of course, I went and it was really wow. fun. Yeah, I was speaking a lot of Spanish. As you know, I study Spanish. It's my minor. So that was nice. But some of her family like doesn't speak English. So they were really making me practice, you know. <laughs> They were like probing me with questions on purpose to try to get me to speak. And I was like, okay, let me, I can do this. <laughs> that is so awesome and so yeah. valuable. It was. Oh my God. It was. I'm like, I need to go back to keep studying my Spanish. But um, other than that, <laughs> it was really awesome. Like there's like this very nice little restaurant there that we went to for New Year's mm -hmm. Eve dinner. And we were all just together, like having fun. There was live music behind us, like an actual saxophone and like drums. Whoa. And yeah, and we were just kind of having fun. Like I'm legal drinking age there. So we had a few sangrias and we were just like nice. having fun and dancing around. It was really awesome. So it was a great New Year's Eve. <laughs> I did not oh expect God. that though. Yeah, that was a total surprise. <laughs> that is so fun. Yeah. And I know you studied Spanish too, right, Lexi, when you were at ASU? So you, I did you probably would know um, how hard it is. I know. I know very little. At least I can tell my patients to sign a consent form because that's usually how I speak to them. But I'm honestly really embarrassed about my level. I wish it was so much better. What do you mean? I just like I just feel like I, I can't really speak that well. And I haven't really used it in mm -hmm. the last years since I graduated. And when in college, I took my Spanish classes, it was all Zoom. So it wasn't really that right. beneficial. That's so true. So, and the most important part of Spanish is using it, you know? So. I know. Yeah. But some of the med schools, they have like these Spanish immersion programs or oh. you can like take a summer in between your first or second year to right. go to like Costa Rica or I think mm -hmm. Puerto Rico as well. Um, yeah. And that's actually something that work I at a really clinic there. Do. Yeah, that's yeah. that's on my bucket list for sure. And my friend's mom has done that before, but she's not like in health. She just went as a translator kind of a thing, like because the people that were on the mission didn't speak Spanish and she does. And then the patients were all Spanish speaking. So she went on one of those as a translator and she was telling me about it. And I was like, wow, that's going on my bucket list. I'm doing that for oh. sure. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, that is so needed. It is. Oh gosh. How was your Christmas? Christmas was good. A lot more chill. <laughs> we just I was just hanging out with my family, but it's always nice, very relaxing and just, you know, spending time with loved ones, which is, I think, the point of Christmas. So how was yours? It was good. It was the same. A lot of the same. <laughs> we, you'll find this interesting. My mom sent me one of those puzzles where it's of a QR code and you have to scan it. And you have to complete the puzzle by February of this year. And if you scan it, you can win either a dollar or a million dollars. Oh. Like some yeah. puzzles have a million dollars. Some puzzles have a hundred thousand oh, dollars. Some okay. have like a thousand dollars, a hundred dollars, a dollar. I don't know. But this puzzle is literally impossible. Okay. What kind of a puzzle is it? It's a square puzzle. It doesn't come with a picture. And oh. it's literally just like pixels. The pixels? Whole thing. Or Wait. whatever, like, you know, a QR code blocks that's mm -hmm. in the QR code. And that it would be really fine weird. if all of the puzzle pieces fit together very mm -hmm. nicely, but the colors don't match. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so the I brought that over. Gets you. <laughs> we, I've been doing that all of Christmas, and I've just been so frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I'm, but then I keep thinking to myself, I'm like, the reason why it's hard is probably because it's a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though it's probably not what's going to happen, I'm going to finish it and I'm going to scan it. It's going to be one dollar, and I'm really no. upset. <laughs> you have to. I mean, well, you said that it's like it could be a range, right? Like it could be between a yeah. dollar and a million. So you have to finish it because you got. Well, like, here's that could the be a million dollars. <laughs> it's like two people. It's a million dollars. Then it's like ten people. It's a hundred thousand dollars, and then it's like sixty million boxes are a dollar. A dollar. Mm hmm. Yeah. Which is crazy because that's like $60 million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you but think about it. Wow. Somebody a put a, invested a lot of money into these puzzles. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's, I'm, you know what? I still am, I am all for you finishing it. I say stick through it and get it done. I have until know. February. Oh, true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you the best of luck with that. If you Thank have some you. downtime, if you have some downtime coming up before you start in medical school and before everything gets so crazy, just try to work on that. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. I just got a bunch of emails this week about med school stuff. I'm really excited oh. for the ones I've gotten accepted to like my student ID background checks. Wow. I had to already? Get CPR certified. Yeah. Oh, I was like, even oh before you've like made your official decision. Yeah, I guess so. Interesting. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I always so, thought like getting your student ID made it seem so official. You're like, I think it's my student ID. It was like your ID. I was like, for what? <laughs> for what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I have to read so the email. <laughs> no, yeah, I understand that. And for you, I'm also in the, kind of in the same boat. I'm getting a lot of school emails right now because the semester is starting. I'm going yeah. back to ASU for the first time since April of last year since I studied wow. abroad in Spain last semester. And yeah, it's it's kind of surreal. I'm like, whoa, I forgot how being like a normal student works. <laughs> I know I'm not like going to these amazing, mm -hmm. I don't know what's in Spain. Just amazing, amazing museums, everything. restaurants. <laughs> yeah. After, after class, like you just yeah. walk downstairs and you're like, oh, let me go get my latte at the cafe downstairs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, after class, we're like, you know, what? let's just go get some tacos and margaritas at like the local, <laughs> like, taco place or like at Casa. Yeah. <laughs> Or like, let's go to this beautiful hilly overlook where we can like watch the sunset together and have a picnic. That was our life when we were in Spain. But oh my yeah, god, it'll still be good at in Arizona. It's just <laughs> a different <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, totally. Of course. <laughs> yeah, my life's just gonna get a little more hectic. Any listeners that are still in their undergrad will know, like the pre med classes are starting again: physics, anatomy, cell biology. <gasps> yeah. So if anybody's in those all classes, of those. Mm hmm. Yep. I'm taking wow. th those and more. I'm actually speaking of Spanish. I'm taking an, a really interesting class this semester. It's called um, Advanced Spanish for Healthcare Professionals. So I'm really excited <gasps> to take that. It's they brought be so it back. Applicable. Yeah. I don't know if they, they literally <laughs> got rid of it. When I actually? entered my third year, they were like, oh, we don't offer that class anymore. They changed it, though, because it used to be like medical terminology. Mm -hmm. That's literally the whole class. Mm -hmm. So I guess they changed it because that's a completely different name. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah. They like no, made excited. ASU better when I left. <laughs> they developed like a pre-health program, mentorships, yeah. like new I, I, healthcare I love class for Spain. I'm like, what the heck? I mean, yeah. however... I did contact the pre-health department. I was like, here are all the problems and here's what you should do about it. <laughs> so maybe how both of you. <laughs> there yeah. were a lot of problems. Right. It's like, that's make this fair. better for the pre-health students. So maybe they listened and that's why you have yeah. that. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, that's awesome of you. I, I like that you always want to leave everything better than you found it. That's very nice because <laughs> not, not too many people are like that. So it's awesome about you, Lexi. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. But we but, so you're taking... Cell bio, physics, yeah, anatomy. anatomy, that Spanish class. That's an I course though. So that's going to be kind of scary because I have to do like Zooms like this every week. Yeah, and then, I did those. Um, yeah, like we have to do like role plays of like taking care of a patient like every week. So that's going to be scary. Oh yeah, my God. I'm also starting my thesis. I'm working with a professor at ASU who's an MD, PhD to do this HPV, this large HPV research project. There's a whole bunch of groups and students working on it. And the goal at the end is to like vaccinate the student body from like HPV. So yeah. I'm really excited to start that. I think those are pretty much my main classes. And then you just add on the labs, the recitations, the lectures, the, you know, so. <laughs> Wait, I want to learn more about your, that project. So what will you be doing on yeah. that group project? So basically they haven't told us anything about it yet. They just notified me that I was accepted and we have an orientation for it in the coming weeks. But basically, it's a very large, I think there's like 64 students that are working on it. And then there's a bunch of faculty mentors. And we all have our own groups. So there's like a biomedicine group, an oncology group. There's a small group of like lab researchers. There's like journalism because they want to make a documentary about it. It's going to be like a yeah. huge thing. Yeah. So there's like all like kind of majors from all across the school and I am in the culture, religion, and politics versus vaccination research group, Whoa. which I think sounds really interesting. It'll just be really cool to like research all those different perspectives and kind of put them together because it's a it's a really important current issue, especially with what happened with the COVID pandemic. So I'm really excited to get started researching it. But at the moment, for details of what we're going to do, I 
can't like can't really say too much yet, but I will be able to update about that as the weeks go on because we have our orientation just next week as school starts. So it's really exciting. <laughs> oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited for you and I'm you. excited to learn more about it. That seems like a great opportunity. And mm-hmm. I remember I got the HPV shots and those hurt really bad. I passed I out my second one. <laughs> Alexi, what? Are you like afraid of needles? <laughs> no, I just got really faint. That can happen. Oh. That's a side effect of I had Gardasil. I think that's the name of it. Mm-hmm. That's one of the okay. side effects is like, I yeah. don't know, like passing out <laughs> or right. something. That's what they said. They're like, here's a Diet Coke. You'll be fine. This yeah. happens. Okay, um, nice. That's scary. That was rough. That's scary. Yeah. I. Oh, I it's re- all right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pass out. I got mine, took a like champ. <laughs> But I yeah. I would say the meningitis shots are really bad. If oh yeah, had those were bad. Shots. Yeah, I'm doing so my tetanus. Doing. I gotta get my tetanus. <laughs> yeah, you should. I'm scared of tetanus. Yeah. <laughs> I have to get. I'm due. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck. But this is going to be a busy semester for me. Lots of classes, especially because I'm also doing an honor section for cell biology. So I'm taking like an mm. honors class for that too. So it's a lot of honors work that I'm doing this semester, but then I should be done with my honors credits. If anybody goes to Barrett the Honors College, they know how that works, but I should be done with yeah. my honors credits then. So it's exciting. I'm getting old. <laughs> Going near graduation. No offense, Lexi. Just kidding. (laughs) What the heck? We're not old. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Especially in medicine. Oh, I'm a baby. I'm a baby baby. That's what everybody keeps telling me. They're like, you're so young. You have so much time left on your journey. I'm like, I know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's a long journey. So (laughs) we're in it together. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and transition to our wonderful episode with Dr. He, and we'll see you there. I'm so excited to welcome Shu Han He, Dr. He. He is a dual faculty member in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Lab of Computer Science at Massachusetts General Hospital and an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is the program director for the MGHIHP's Healthcare Data Analytics Program. He was the author of the Anatomic Heart and Lung Emoji, which is now available on mobile devices worldwide, which I have used actually for my poster. Um, He was the co-founder of Get Us PPE, a nationally recognized nonprofit that distributed 18 million pieces of PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic. He also launched ConductScience.com, a supplier to over 2,400 laboratories worldwide in novel scientific technologies while in medical school. His work has been featured in Fast Company, Nature, The Verge, Time, Forbes, to name a few. And he was named one of emergency medicine's 25 under 45 modern healthcare top 25 emergent leaders. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. Welcome. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I know we met quite a little while ago, not too long ago at the AMSA conference here in Phoenix. And I went up to you and I was like, please come speak at my conference. (laughs) And you just gave an excellent presentation. It was awesome. I loved your presentation at the last NPHC conference, by the way. I just want to throw that in there right in the beginning. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, you guys are the future of healthcare. So I think uh, anything I could do to support, teach and bring as much of the things I'm passionate about as possible, that makes me really happy. Awesome. awesome. Well, I do want to go ahead and jump into my first question I have for you here. And I just want to go ahead and ask what emerging trends or advancement in technology do you believe will have the most significant impact on the future of healthcare? And how can we as pre-medical students or incoming medical students prepare for these changes? Yeah. So I really like this question because I think um, I do get this question a lot. And I think it's really important to frame what is medicine and what is technology, right? Yeah. You know, I think about technology as and health and data as really the exact same thing. As in a stethoscope, it was a piece of very advanced technology at one point. And now we just think about that as regular day-to-day medicine, right? right. And things we, things we deal with every single day, vital signs, a heart rate, a blood pressure, a potassium level, a wait time, a sepsis criteria, these are all pieces of data. Right. Mm-hmm. And these are all pieces of data generated by technology. And so I really want to emphasize to future health leaders that these scary things of technology and AI and data are really just everything we do every single day. And yeah. just different versions of that. 
So in particular, I like to think that we're really on the cusp of two really amazing changes in the way we think about health and in ways that I'm particularly passionate about. The first is in digital health in the way that we report uh, subjective outcomes. So when we talk about how someone is feeling, right, we often say, you know, they have pain on a scale of zero to 10. That's what we call more the objective finding. But we also yeah. want to know how people feel. Like, are they happy, sad? Do they feel that they can walk 10 miles? Do they feel like they can play with their children more? And those are the things that we're trying to do in health to make them, make people feel not just like a lab value that we're trying to fix, but really we're trying to make someone's life better, right? So they can function more and do the things that they want to do, like spend time with friends and family. And I always think about that as a patient or outcome, right? A pro. These patient poor outcomes are digitized, which means that we can get so much better information about how people feel today. And the example of this is the it was something I'm particularly passionate about is a visual analog scale or the Wong Baker scale. So you know those little smiley faces you see in clinics, right? Yeah. It says, Are you happy today? Or yeah, how much pain yeah. do you have? Those yeah, like the minute clinic. Paper. Yeah, exactly. Those things are a piece of paper. So you only know at that time and point. Now oh, my pain went from a Happy, uh, very happy or very sad, actually, to happy, right? <laughs> yeah. But what if you could do that every single day, 20 times a day, all the time, right? You mm. want to know your baseline and you want to know how you feel. Well, if you digitize these things, and we have a, a paper that we put out about a year ago called the Emoji Based Visual Analog Scale, which is basically those same smiley faces, but using emoji, which means that the underlying code for emoji or something called Unicode, which is the same technology that underlies all uh, text, numbers, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese characterizations in the world. It's the same thing that the code called Unicode. And so you can then analyze how people feel in terms of sadness and emotion, just like you can analyze uh, text like happy, H-A-P-P-Y, or Uh sad, S-A-D, or heart rate, 110, or knife emoji, and sad. If you put those three combinations, (laughs) sad, knife, heart rate 110, it yeah. may mean as strong of a intent as I want to hurt myself, which are English characterizations, mm-hmm. right? And we yeah. should probably intervene and do something about it if we're in the emergency department, for example. Mm-hmm. And so a better understanding of this language, a, a more unified approach to how we communicate with each other using digital tools can really expand our view of holistic health, of not just making uh, someone's potassium better or LFTs better, but also their entire happiness and report outcomes. And that's something that I think is really exciting. The other thing I, I think is really exciting is the way we approach statistically data. So let me let me talk about this way and I'm gonna make it very simple, okay? So uh, when we think about lab tests, we think about sensitivity and specificity. That's something that you guys will learn in medical school. This will come all the time and yeah. it's on every freaking board question. And yeah. I'll always have to reference to, to this day, I still don't remember all the equations, okay, to be clear. So that's um, fair. the way they teach this is it's if you're doing a lab screening test, let's say COVID, flu, RSV, you want a highly sensitive test, as in it'll pick it up if it's there, right? Yeah. But sometimes it's not there, but they'll still say it's positive because you want to err on the side of caution. That's very commonly used to decide how do we do testing, uh, radiology reports, lab tests, things like that. There's also specificity, which is it'll tell you if it's there, but sometimes it'll miss if it's let me see if I'm saying this right. It'll, it, when it's there, it'll confirm that it's there, but it won't pick up all the cases of what is there. So let's say it's a fire alarm. When it goes off, you know it's accurate, but sometimes there's fire and it's not going off yet, right? Mm. So it's highly specific. So you know it's accurate all the time. Are you following me? Yes. So there's an alarm that yeah. goes off all the time, but you're not sure if it's actually real fire, but just to be safe time, you'll listen to it. You have a fire alarm that does not go off. When it does, it's always right. So you want to take that really seriously. But yeah. now these alarms tell you about how big the fire is, right? Right. So we want to be able to, to create those sort of detection mechanisms for lab values and tests. And it's really just the way that we do math. And it's ca- I call it entropy. And the reason I bring mm. this concept up is that that's actually how large language models work today, is that they are removing uncertainty in the way that we describe uh, next letters. So hello you'll probably say, I am, or my name is Dr. He, right? That's mm-hmm. after who comes hello. Uh, not, hello, I don't know, what, what do you not say? Apple, orange, kangaroo, right? <laughs> so we removed a lot of that guesswork because those things aren't all equally probabilistic. That's, that's the word. So these are really interesting ways that we're approaching 
data problems in medicine. And they're really yeah. all coming for technology, but it really is just ways we can do better in medicine. I really think that's a really exciting time. Yeah, medicine is technology. Technology is medicine. And uh, we have so much ability to do more in the, in the future upcoming years and months. And it feels like every day that goes by is like another 10, another uh, 10 years. So it's really exciting seeing what comes out every single day. It really is. And I was actually just thinking about this this week. I currently work as a medical scribe in a dermatology clinic. And something that we often see with like patient cases is patients who come in for psoriasis and we want to start them in a biologic. There isn't a test out there that indicates whether or not this patient would be best fit for this certain type of biologic. The biologic industry is very new and there are multiple different types of this medication. And usually we just start them on one. And if that doesn't work, we can start them on another is what I've seen so far in my experience. And I asked my provider, I was like, why don't we have a test that would indicate which would work best for them? And he said, he's tried, he's called like Sonora Quest or other like industries and seeing what the research is going on there about. And just made me really think about, oh my gosh, this is something that there's a need for that I'm sure that will be fulfilled in the next 20 or 30 years. And it's very cool as someone who's going into this field and hasn't started medical school yet, but will soon. I'm like, oh, there are needs for this. And I'm excited to see which pocket I would fill. Yeah. So, yeah. I just wanted to say that listening to Dr. He talk is really awesome because you can just set, like tell how passionate he is about technological advances, which is awesome because I think a lot of the older generation in medicine has a lot of fear surrounding the developments of technology and how quickly it's developing and AI and how it's going to affect their jobs and their futures. And so it's really refreshing to hear such like an excited perspective where you're you're like, yeah, it's just making everything so much more efficient. And we're going to be able to tell a lot better about what did you say, like the quantity or like the depth of the disease when you do these tests. So that's going to be really awesome. And I'm excited now just <laughs> hearing you talk about it. This is getting me fired up. <laughs> yeah. That's my hope, right? Is that you know, one thing that I came to terms with as I got older was, uh, and I remember being pre-med in medical school, was I always wondered, why doesn't that happen? Why doesn't that exist? And just like, you know, Alexa, you mentioned the biologics, right? Matching to the disease. And I always yeah. wonder, well, it must be because I'm missing something, right? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't know it. I'm not there yet. I'll learn more. Right. But then if you actually dig around at some of these problems, you realize, wait, actually, it's just because no one has dealt with it. And so no. you start to realize how much opportunity there is yeah. to solve problems. And yeah. exciting. Um, <laughs> insanely exciting. Yeah. But I'll bring the example of the emoji thing. I was just kind of annoyed that there weren't more organ emoji and <laughs> that the smiley faces weren't on a digital version. Yeah. There's no reason why someone hadn't done it. And what we did right. was nothing particularly exciting. It was just that, well, we finally just fixed the problem, right? And it scratched our own itch. And I would say there's so much more. Yeah. There's yeah. still to this day, no liver emoji, no kidney emoji, no uh, stomach emoji. It drives me insane. Horrible. <laughs> How so we're, we're working on it. When we're future doctors, I'm going to need to text the exactly. hematologist a liver emoji <laughs> regarding the patient's yeah. case. There it needs no to be available. Emoji. There was yeah. no white oh my blood gosh. cell emoji. After what recently has happened in the last five years, are you kidding me? There's no white blood cell emoji? That's insane. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, what year did you get the heart emoji and the lung emoji out? What year did uh, they come out? Tw- early 2020. Came in January. Early 2020. 2020. Wow, yeah. that is awesome. So it's really recent, but that's amazing that you did that. You saw a problem and you worked on it and just solved it. <laughs> well, <laughs> now I'm going to say that. It's not me. There's a ton of people on this oh, yeah, problem, of course. right? So, yeah. um, really interesting background. There's a movie about this, about the emoji campaign, not just ours, but they actually have an amazing example in this movie. In 2016, I believe it was the year, there was a, in the movie, a film, it was premiered at Tribeca. And there was this amazing high school student who was very passionate about having a hijab emoji. And she has this line in the movie that I I am amazed by. There were at one point four mailbox emoji to represent the different types of flags, right? Up, down, left, right. But there was no hijab emoji to represent the 500 million Muslims across the world. So having that passion, I think, for solving problems that you see in the immediacy and is the point of what we're trying to do in our careers, right? I, to me, I, I don't mm-hmm. see work as different. I'm not trying to show up and clock in and clock out. I think about it as, what problems am I going to solve? Because my life's really short. All life is short, right? You work in the ER long enough yeah. to realize that. And yeah. these problems that young people see, and especially in pre-health or medicine, they have a fresh perspective. And that is one of the most valuable perspectives that people can have. 
I encourage anyone who's listening to this pod or, you know, in a pre-health world, and you guys have an amazing conference to really think about what pumps do you guys see? Because there's probably a real solution that you guys are aware of already. You're probably not. As well. Yeah, that is true. It makes me think I had the patients oftentimes come into our clinic and they have something called granuloma annulari, which is a condition that really we have no idea exists. Patients just show up and they have these like annular or circular sort of lesions on their skin. And when they show up, my provider says, you know, it's not dangerous. If you want to live with it, you can live with it. There's nothing we can do at this point to like solve it or get rid of it, but it's just there. And it might be there for the rest of your life and may come and go. And patients are like, why, where did this come from? And we were like, we have no idea the research isn't out there yet about it. But the reason being it's not out there is because it's not, you know, harming anybody or any anybody's life. So it's just interesting things like that. I'm like, I think there is a need to kind of know why, because there may be associated comorbidities with this disease that we don't know about. Maybe. And that just opens up a place for new, fresh faces and perspectives to look into it. So there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we should probably transition to the second question because it's something that I'm really interested in primarily because I know that these new tools are very fresh and a lot of people really love talking about them. So we wanted to ask your perspective. How do you see ChatGPT and other AI-powered tools affecting clinical decisions and outcomes in the future? Yeah. So I always caveat this conversation with like, uh, you can't use tools until they're proven, regulated, proven out, and approved all these things. So um, <laughs> let, let me just say that, you know, I work in the computer science lab, and one of the early things I've been working on have been, I call them the small language models, not large language models, like very specified models for particular use cases. Yeah. When ChatGPT came out, and that was a year ago, it's only one year, it's really crazy. Cannot believe um, that. <laughs> yeah. It was a game changer for everybody, right? To understand, yeah. wow, you can do that? <laughs> I think a couple of things happened is number one, my conversations around what a language model was or machine learning was, which just completely changed, right? To overnight to, oh, well, that seems very far off in the world to, oh, okay, this is a real thing. It's here now, right? It's here to stay. And so I think there are a lot of people doing really interesting things with existing tools, which is amazing. I think the yeah. deeper part of this is really how we can start to treat medicine like a language. And then what's so interesting is that ChatGPT is a language model. It decodes mm-hmm. language and it gives you answers that are amazingly accurate. And it does that with methodologies that we can do to apply to other things. And I'm giving examples. It uses English language, right? And decodes them and gives you words and meaning that make sense. We can do the same thing for disease states and vital signs and as your letters. So if you come to the emergency department and you say chest pain, the shorter breath and substernal crushing chest pain with tearing pain rating to the back. That has insinuation and meaning like a language, right? And then you add in this language of a heart rate of 110 or 130, blood pressure 200 systolic, a GCS of eight. You're now putting together a picture of somebody who has potentially a very life-threatening condition, in this case, aortic dissection. But this is a language problem of uh, how do you describe what's happening accurately And then decode as quickly as possible the way to get to the right answer, which is we need a CT scan right now to get this answer, right? And you get those pixels, but you don't actually know what's happening. You just have a bunch of pixels in front of you, which we think is very real, right? We assume that's real. But sometimes CT scan can miss what's happening. So we always have a language that we're trying to communicate with. And we're doing our best to decode what is the underlying meaning of disease and what's happening here. And that is essentially what large language models do. So I think that's really exciting to the point of I brought up a little earlier. Somebody says to me on their phone, a knife, sad face, right? And then they're tearful in front of me with a heart rate of 110. Do they actually have to say to me, I want to kill myself? Like, I don't know if that's totally necessary to say those three words. You may have the same meaning via many different routes. And yeah. we can potentially start to uh, better understand how that lives in uh, more native ways like, like phones and computers and or the way people speak, whether it doesn't even have to be English. Somebody who speaks Mandarin Chinese, like I do, or Arabic, or English, all use the same emoji. And so that is one of the most universal languages. And they could use it in their own personal ways. So I think I bring up that whole discussion because this is what ChatGPT and AI does. And we start to approach medical problems in so many different new powerful ways. And that's what's really, really exciting to me. 
But obviously, we have so many new tools now. We have uh, yeah. we have Midjourney, we have Visual uh, Composers. I think people can just use these tools to better plug into their data that they're getting from ER. Or there's a lot of uh, apps now that give you patient notes and give you data that might yeah. be really hard for people to interpret. And they might be able to put that data into their own language model to help understand what's happening. So wherever it might go, it's really exciting. I'm really excited every day to see kind of the new tools that come out. But I can say that it feels like we're on a, the a brink of a new era. And yeah. it's just a different exciting thing. I really hope AI scribes, you know, like those scribes who can in- interpret what you're saying in the room, like the AI versions into a, a nice, good note are actually good. I was very curious about this. I saw this on TikTok, this like doctor who was promoting it as, as an ad, one of these AI scribe tools. And I was like, how well does that work? You know, you're saying all of these different things in the room and how can it catch what's actually pertinent to put into a, a history of present illness and the ROS and differential diagnosis and so on as you're like telling the robot what to write. But I think that is an area that will really, really help the future of healthcare and our providers as documentation is one of the leading causes of burnout. Actually, I learned that at the AMSA conference last year, they were saying like healthcare documentation is a huge burden for people, but yeah. I hope that becomes a better tool for us to use. Yeah. Yeah. And I just love this idea of how you're talking about emojis. That is so interesting to me because, I mean, it's like how everybody says a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And like you said, it's every language uses the same emojis. You can translate that into so many different things. Personally, at the clinic that I work at, I know that we have problems with that. Like, Patients come in that are solely Spanish speaking or very little English, and they're trying so hard to articulate what the problem is, their symptoms, what they think is wrong, just trying to explain to the doctor every little detail. And we know that with these cases, it's really important to know the details and they can't get the words out. So it would be so awesome if they could use some sort of AI pictograph method to try to communicate this as well. So that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just a, one other example there is that uh, you guys are so early, right? So uh, you have to realize yeah. uh, in a lot of these exams, you just drilled into your brain uh, these keywords, thunderclap mm-hmm. headache. Do you guys know that one? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I do so not. What does, all right, what does thunderclap headache mean, Alexia? Stroke, right? Ooh, very good potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It means that uh, we're very concerned about uh, an unreasonable bleed had that burst, right? Yeah, so, or head I mean, bleed, yeah. Yeah, thunderclap headache, it's like it's almost like if you use the thunder emoji and brain, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so these words that we use in medicine are just phrases and you have to kind of know the lingo to get your way around right if you say the right word then the headache you'll instantly get a ct in most in yeah months. absolutely so, or worst headache of your life yeah um, exactly. i used to work in an er <laughs> right. so you know so you know right yeah. and um that word association seems so unfair if you happen to be plugged in to the association that people know about right it's a common mm-hmm. language but if you don't it may be more difficult to get the access and the resources you need so yeah. being able to create tools that allow uh, greater access is something i'm really passionate about uh, to your point yeah. yeah yeah you know when i worked in the er i never realized how important those keywords were especially as a scribe my provider would look at me and be like make sure you write that down like mm-hmm. specifically worst headache of your life because it like validates that we need to get these multiple CT scans, especially the CT of the head and neck and like consult with a consult with a neurologist or neurosurgeon. So it's just pretty interesting. Words are very, very powerful. I want to ask my next question. See, you know, I know we talked a lot about technology and ChatGPT and AI powered tools, but I think your role is very interesting working in a data analytics lab. In addition to you're still working as a professor of medicine as well at Harvard. Yep. What does a day in the life look like for you? Yeah, I break my days into two parts. The first is I call computer time, morning brain time. I'm precious in the mornings um, mm-hmm. to think in ways that may not have a predefined script. So whenever I'm doing work on computer science or research or building something. I try to spend a little bit of time still making things because otherwise I don't want to get too far away from from that practice. Those things are best done in the mornings, for me anyways, because I'm fresh, having my cup of coffee. uh, I'm able to think, sit down and just produce. That's really nice to have that time in the morning. It's often a little bit of quiet time. And I have to ask, what time do your mornings start? You're such a I'm busy early. man. I don't even know no. if I want to know the answer. <laughs> oh, I'm at eight o'clock. Eight to nine. Oh, okay. That's, oh, fair. that's, that's, that's fair. That's good. 
I've heard some uh, scary answers from doctors before, so just thought that would be an interesting. <laughs> no, no, no. This is something I, I would say. As you guys go through, make sure you take care of your, your health. Mm-hmm. I am very religious about my sleep. I Amazing. make sure I get enough sleep because I don't know how I would be able to do things if you don't sleep, right? I'm um, the same way. Yeah, so protecting sleep is really important. I fast in the mornings. I don't eat breakfast, which is really nice. It adds a little bit more morning time. Uh, nice. Drink a little bit of coffee. I tend to exercise around uh, noon or 11. And I actually fa- exercise fasted, which I think is actually very nice for continuing just like the morning freshness almost, right? Because once yeah. I eat something, I know <laughs> that my ability to think will not be quite as good. Um, so, <laughs> What an interesting thought. <laughs> so uh, I usually break my fast around like one o'clock or so, take a walk afterwards. And my clinical time usually starts around three o'clock and I go from three to 11. So three to 11 time uh, is my, I think... I call it the, the scripted time, right? A lot of medical medicine is really within a certain framework of what we know is acceptable, is pure, acceptable. And so you don't want to be too creative. You know, that's how you know. Uh, you don't want to be deviating too much from accepted practice. So that's the best time where I feel like I'm moving around. I've had my lunch. I am, uh, I'm, it's really a physical sport, you know, walking around the yard and so much. So uh, that's really time I feel like I'm at my best in the afternoon. So from that 3 to 11, I'm, I'm in the ER. And then I, you know, I reset. So, and then uh, I'm awake at uh, home by midnight, uh, awake by eight or nine, and then rinse and repeat. So. That's awesome. So what yeah. do you do when you're a professor? Like, what does that role entail? Yeah. So it's mostly just all research. Okay. I'm mostly yeah. a researcher. So our lab, up at, at the end of the show, I'm certainly inviting anyone who is interested in kind of clinical informatics and uh, immersive medicine to come and do research with us. I think we think a lot about entropy and machine learning. We work a lot with emoji uh, or yeah. these digital tools for how to collect better patient data. You know, I call it, uh, it's a little bit of a, I call this a little joke, but it's a little bit of a numeracy. I think we have a strong literacy bias in our society and mm. we just, we just do numeracy. It's the only difference. Uh, numeracy and literacy are no different. Um, we work with numbers just like language and letters. So uh, to describe certain uh, occurrences. And so we've put out work anywhere from, analyzing websites and how they communicate data and that uh, the workflow to how do we create more emoji to better communicate with patients to then uh, more really complex, you know, machine learning uh, methods to reduce uncertainty uh, in methods, things like that. So it runs the gamut. I love it because it's fun and gets me on my feet. I certainly work with uh, MASHA students as well who are doing data analytics. Oh, cool. so that's a little bit of administration as well, the research administration. And then I have my own company. So we do a lot of work with uh, hardware manufacturing computer yeah. vision, AI, machine learning. And what's really fun is I get to actually be on the ground and create those things with newest packages. So wow. uh, I get to follow the the latest in open source YOLO V8. You know, that's my, my favorite new package. So yeah, yeah. that is so cool. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that is really so fun. fun. Yeah, you are incredible. The amount of things that you can fit into one day. That is so yeah, inspirational. Wow. <laughs> I don't want to hear anybody say there's not enough hours in the day anymore, I guess, because <laughs> you managed to get it all in there. But that is so awesome. And for me, especially as Lexi knows this, but I don't know if you know yet, but I was really interested in computer science back in the day in high school. I was really involved in it. And I always thought about having what intersections there were between medicine and computer science. So this has just been so interesting for me to hear and listen to you talk about. But I want to ask our last question here, which you've kind of touched on when you mentioned your lab, but many of our listeners are undergraduates interested in the medical field. Do you have any advice for our listeners if they would like to pursue a similar career path in healthcare data analytics? Absolutely. Actually, before I get to that, can, can I ask you a question? Nelly? So, oh, sure. You, you're interested in everything I've said. Like, what things are you working on that is similar or close? I love learning about just kind of things that interest you guys. Oh, I wish that I had a better answer for this, but I paused my my <laughs> computer science passion because in high school I was really involved in it. I loved Java coding. It was just kind of I had an introduction class and I had a lot of mentors in computer science that were awesome. And they told me that I should pursue a, like an intersection between the two. But when I got to college, I didn't really know how to balance it. So I've kind of stopped studying computer science. But it was something that I always really loved. Like I loved coding. I loved problem solving. The packages were really cool just to use them and to get more involved in how to problem solve in code. Like how you said, it was a whole language. And that was just really fun for me. I really, really, really liked it. So maybe one day I'll get back to it. But yeah, I wish I was working on something right now, but I'm kind of just on my pre-med journey. <laughs> but, you know, maybe one day listening to you like talk about all the stuff that you're doing and how you're integrating them. I think I'm definitely going to start looking into this again. I definitely think I need to pick up that passion back. 
but yeah <laughs> that was all that was all i have for my projects but <laughs> alexa what about you Got well, see this thriving podcast. I have no experience in computer science whatsoever, but everyone around me is surrounded. My mom basically worked on projects revolving like Watson AI and blockchain for IBM. And she now works for an AI technologies company where they like work with the CIA. I'm not really sure. I wish I knew more, but she's very interesting. And my boyfriend's <laughs> a, a software engineer and he works on uh, I don't know, software at PayPal. But basically, other than that, I have really never dove in to that field. I'm honestly kind of scared. My boyfriend yeah. says I should have taken like a, a computer coding class. <laughs> right. He thinks it's a very essential skill to have in college. Mm -hmm. I just never made time for it. I wonder if they offer that in medical school. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> I, I took a class at ASU my first semester. I took a object-oriented programming class my very oh, wow. first semester at ASU to kind of test it Dang. out again. But yeah, it was hard, but it was awesome. <clears throat> it was a yeah. lot of really, really hard problem solving. So I'm, I have so much respect for people that are, do computer yeah. science and software engineers. It's really awesome. It, but it seems future. very difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's why no, I, I want to put the bet that notion. I, I would say that... There are many different ways to approach that problem of like, it, you can get extremely technical and it's extremely difficult and you have to start yeah. learning like all the, you know, optimized algorithms and stuff like that. But really what we're trying to do is solve <laughs> problems, right? right? So this idea of you guys uh, have a, an amazing website for this pre health pod and conference, that is the yes. right there, right? And it's made. I know. <laughs> and this idea that yeah. it has to be more difficult to be more, more real and more rigorous. I actually should tell people like, listen, as long as you're solving the problem, right? And yeah. you deliver value, that is innovation right there. And that's technology. So that's what I love. And, and I bring this up because I was kind of the same path as you guys were in. And I was a programmer growing up in Italy. And my dad was a computer programmer. I was, so I grew up in a computer science lab. Oh, but that's awesome. I didn't really take it that seriously. You know, I was going to go to medical school. And yeah. so I actually had stopped coding as much after I, I did an internship mm. after my undergraduate uh, in uh, engineering. And, you know, mm. I had a path whether I was going to go into finance and engineering and tech versus uh, medicine. And the great, this is very different uh, the time of 2008, the great financial crisis. So uh, uh, they made my life very much easier. <laughs> yeah. But I never stopped really loving building things or solving problems. And I think exactly. that is uh, what I hope to, to communicate is that like, that doesn't need to be separate from memorizing a lot of things and learning a lot of um, new diseases and like, this very complex language. language. It's really yeah. still fundamentally just tools to be able to solve problems. And you should never really lose that that knows for it, right? Because that's really what right. we do all these things. You know? Yeah. I'm um, so glad I have that little background. I think it'll yeah. help me a lot when I get into medical school. Absolutely. So keep working on it, right? That's the way I think it's easiest. Yeah. Um, a big master's or a PhD, and you don't have to do something like that. You just continue to try to solve problems along the way. And that skill set is so valuable and important, right? So true. Um, so with that said, I, very tangible ways is um, number one, I would love for undergrads to continue and, and to continue to learn this, right? As I mentioned, yeah. technology and data and health is just medicine. And it's just another approach that really provides unique ways to leadership and to be have a really prominent career. So I think about it as, you know, if you're a future leader and you want to be a medical director or chair or whatever it might be, uh, a data approach is a really good way to understand and, and solve problems in a really asymmetric way. It's a really high, high ROI of time. So we do run a master's program at the Ed National Hospital. We have a master's science and data analytics program. There's six credits built in where we work with a lot of organizations. They work with the Department of University of Medicine, or we have nonprofit organizations that uh, students will work with on very tangible data problems, just in order to right, solve problems every single day. And that's how I think, really, frankly, that's how I keep up. It's really impossible otherwise. You got to be on the ground solving problems, right? Otherwise, it's just too hard to follow in a textbook. The other thing is, you know, I would reach out to tell any students listening, I would love to take you into our lab. We work with students, you know, we have something like 20, 30 students. And I'm very proud of uh, how uh, far our students have gotten. Recently, we had two residents and matched into a clinical, one including clinical informatics fellowship at Stanford, which I'm extremely proud of. Yeah, and congrats wow. to them. Yeah. And then one medical student who matched at Walter Reed in ophthalmology. So, <gasps> That's uh, really cool. Incredible. Oh my gosh. So uh, we've had students uh, kind of be very successful and kind of every stage of the career. We had one undergraduate uh, recently match at uh, Northwestern for a medical school. So, wow. you know, these are things that I think being able to approach early and young is really best because 
research is really hard to do like, you know, over one semester, right? If you just do it in yeah. three months, it's really hard. Whereas if you do it a little bit over a couple of years or semesters, it's a lot better because there's more longitudinal time to develop skills and to work on projects, right? Absolutely. Um, so I'll share my email and we'll put something in the show notes that I get in touch if anyone's interested. Yeah, we have a absolutely. We have a conference on uh, health innovation coming up in May. Um, <gasps> we do this. Uh, we're doing Where? this at the university. Uh, yep, here in Boston. Uh, we're oh. doing it with the University of Riverside. Um, they have a West Coast version. We have an East Coast version. Um, I was like, wait called... a minute. <laughs> That's <laughs> not, not in Boston. Boston. <laughs> But it's the uh, Consortium for Health Innovation Partnerships, um, basically getting together uh, health uh, organizations, uh, but also people doing innovation in tech and digital and data to come together and really solve problems. So um, <gasps> anyone who's really interested in this space, uh, we'll put a link and go register. Um, yeah. I, I need to give the tickets up. It's in June. That's so awesome. If you I need... Think- if you need speakers, my mom speaks at conferences all the time. Sure. She I mean, spoke at the United Nations last week about AI. Oh my gosh, I mean, that is awesome. I was, thinking, I was thinking the one that runs the undergraduate conference, you know? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you guys to come and speak. So, um, oh man. <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, this is all about human talent and development and having more welcoming people come into really think about how to innovate and solve yeah. problems, right? So mm-hmm. that, that can happen at every stage. It doesn't matter if you're and attending a fellow resident medical student pre-med, you know, you have energy in this and help solve problems and we need that. Oh, wow. That's great. awesome. Great message to end on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure having you in the podcast, Dr. He. Thank you again for joining us and being a part of our MPHC group here. Thank you so um, much. It's been awesome. And anything else to share before we go ahead and hop off? No, nope. thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it yeah. Thank you again. Thank you so much. This podcast was produced by Ari Rosenthal and Lorelai Edmonds. You can find our conference on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at National Pre-Health Community or MPHC 2020. You can also find our podcast on Instagram at Pre-Health Pod. You can find all of our events, including our next National Pre-Health Conference, May 18th through the 19th, nationalprehealthconf.org. And please like, leave a review, or tell one friend if you liked our pod. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye.